Good morning, saunterers, and welcome to Saunter to the Stable number six. And today we have got a lovely, beautiful um, story. So I'm going to pray and then we'll, uh, we'll have a look at that. But I think first the dog wants to be put up on the sofa, so one second. That is the dog dealt with. She will be happy until someone walks by and then she'll start barking. <laughs> so let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you um, for a lovely day. Thank you for the frost on the shed roof. How exciting. And Lord, thank you for the clear sky and thank you for your love and your kindness, and your goodness and all the wonderful things you bring into our lives day after day after day. And Lord, today we welcome you as we look at your word. Amen. So good morning, Alison and Sandy and Pete and Pat and Mike, Lorraine. I think some others have slipped by while I was praying. But God bless you. Great to see you guys. And you are such fun to be with. So um, this little book, I've inserted it in simply because it is one of my favourites. And it's got some incredibly prophetic stuff in it. It might be just if you're trying to be really hard and fast, it might be just stretching it a tiny bit to make it be a prophetic statement about Jesus. I, I think the actual, if you take the book as a whole, it absolutely 100% is. Good morning, Karen and Sky and Sarah and Colin. Nice to see you all. So this is the book of Ruth. We're going to look at the story of Ruth today. And this book... Um, is a hugely important breadcrumb, prophetic breadcrumb towards the um, appearance of Jesus in Bethlehem. And it this book opens up some really, really important themes. It introduces them into the narrative, the story of scripture. So number one, first of all, in this story, we Bethlehem, the town of Bethlehem appears on our screens for the first time and suddenly Bethlehem is being, the stage is being set for something to go on there. And this is a, a little, very personal, very beautiful little drama, but it happens, it's centred around Bethlehem. Good morning, Fran, and good morning, Kev, good morning, Johnny and Valerie. Um, secondly, we have the introduction of a, we've been looking very much, um, the story has been very much about the bloodline that's come from Abraham through Isaac, Jacob, and then into Judah, surprising little twist there. And uh, then we've looked at Moses and the kind of interesting relationship that God had with him. And then now we're looking at um uh, introducing a wild card into the mix because Ruth is from the tribe of Moab. Now, Moab, the name means from father, and it is as bad as it seems. This is the the um, descendants of Lot. And if you remember, Lot's wife was killed in the judgment that God brought on Sodom and Gomorrah when she looked back and she was turned into a pillar of salt and Lot escaped with his two daughters. His two daughters were thinking, we're never going to get a guy. And so, yeah, they um, got their father drunk and lay with him and both became pregnant. And the eldest daughter um, called her son Moab, which means from father. So Moab came from an incestuous relationship and they were outside of God's chosen people. They were kind of considered to be foreigners and outsiders of the covenant. So they were, so didn't start out so well. Good morning, Sarah and Alistair. But that's why this story is so important. It's so pivotal and central and it's so much about Jesus. Um, but what I'm going to have to try and do is get through it fairly quickly because I love to tell a good story and I will get lost in the detail. Right, so number one, here's the picture. Ruth and her husband Elkanah leave their town um, and they, um, from Bethlehem, they leave the town of Bethlehem because there's a famine and they head off to um, Moab with their sons Mahlon and Kilion 
and while they that so they go in and search for food when they get to the land um the um the two boys eventually fall in love well their dad dies and the two boys fall in love with two local girls and the names are Ruth and Orpah and so um then the two boys die so it's a tragedy of tra triple tragedy dad dies first the boys get married <coughs> excuse me then they die before they've had a chance to pass on any descendants and so there's Naomi um the mum left with these two daughters-in-law in a land that she doesn't really belong in she's just a temporary resident and she's thinking boy this <laughs> everything has gone so bad for me and she says to the girls listen don't call me Naomi call me which um, means pleasant but call me Mara which means bitter and so she was broken and she looks at these two girls and she says, look, I'm going to go back to my home country because I gather there's food there now. So I'm going to go back to Bethlehem. You go, you girls stay here, get married, have a lovely life. And do you know what? You've been great and you've been so kind to me. And they say, no, 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 we're going to come with you, whatever. We, we love you. You've been so good to us and we love you and we're going to come with you. So um, Naomi says, no, no, don't be silly, because listen, if I was to should I have the pleasure of being married again and even if I had a son would you be willing to wait for him to grow up don't be silly this is ridiculous go back get married and so Orpah cries lots of tears and she goes back Ruth's crying and she said no I'm staying and Ruth uses language which we understand to be covenantal language she says to Naomi listen where you go, I will go. Your God will be my God. Where you die, there I'll be buried. And she says, your people will be my people. And what, what Ruth is doing as a complete outsider, she's saying, Naomi, I want to be part of whatever it is that you are. I, there's something. I've seen something in your life. And Naomi's looking at her thinking, what can you possibly see in me? Such a broken and... Oh destroyed individual what can you possibly see in me now and yet Ruth has seen something in Naomi and she's seen she's basically uh, just drawn to God in this older woman and she, she says I, I, I'm, I'm coming with you wherever you go so they trog on back to Bethlehem and it they arrive at the time of the barley harvest which is significant so um, they go back to their their plot of land which they had owned, Naomi and her husband had owned, but they're poor. They've got no crops in the ground. They're not really there to kind of live off the land. They're there just to survive. And they are like paupers, two widows. And it's a bit like Ruth going to the food bank. Bless her. She's, she's there. She's got, she needs charity. She needs help from the locals and so she Naomi says listen there's a wealthy person nearby and you know and anyway so she goes out and she she says look go and go and Ruth says I'm going to go and glean some grain so that meant going around after the harvesters had been cutting the grain and they were not too thorough God had required that they should not be too thorough in picking up every ear of corn that falls to the ground but they should leave some for the poor people to come and gather and that was called gleaning and so when we use that word don't we oh I've managed to glean something from this experience you know and so what we're talking about is picking up the scraps and so Ruth is there and she goes into this field and she finds a favorable environment to work and she's not ha harassed and she comes home and she's done really well and Ruth says, um, her, her mother-in-law says, oh, where did you glean today? Um, and she says, oh, I was gleaning in the field of Boaz. And she's, Naomi says, that's really good because he's actually a relative of ours. Well, what was happening was that Boaz was seeing this lady. She, she knew, sorry, he knew how kind she had been to her mother-in-law, Naomi. And Boaz was saying to his helpers, listen, to the harvesters, just chuck a bit of extra corn down on the ground when you see Ruth coming along because she's a good egg she's been really good to her mother-in-law don't harass her don't come on to her you fellas 
don't wolf whistle her because she's quite cute. Leave her alone, let her get on with the job and here, you know, just show her a bit of favour. Well, anyway, Ruth came home with 22 litres of barley, which I did a little calculation. It's about 15, uh, 14 kilos of barley. That's a lot of barley to carry. And it's about the equivalent volume of um, 11 of those two litre bottles of Coke. Just useless information. But I try and work it out how actually heavy would that be for a young woman to carry. That's quite heavy and is bulky. Anyway, so she gets it home. Naomi says, this is amazing. Anyway, Ruth continues to glean in Boaz's field. And the story goes on. The story goes on. And... Um, this is what happens. So um, Boaz says nice things to her. And in um, chapter two, verse 10, it's, she, they're having a conversation and he's saying, listen, when you're thirsty, just go and drink what the harvesters are drinking. You know, eat, you know, just be with us, be part of our company. And then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground and said to him, why have I found favour in your eyes since you should take note, sorry, that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? Now, this obviously meant a lot to Ruth. She understood that something significant was going on here because she should have been treated, she would have expected, shall we say, to have been treated like an outsider. Anyway, then Boaz explains and he says, you've been really kind to your mother-in-law and that's why I'm returning this kindness to you. And verse 12, he speaks a blessing over her. He says, the Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward will be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Remember the word wings also appears in uh, Psalm 91, isn't it? Um, you know, and all that we we get used to that idea of God putting his wings over us in the Psalms. Well, this is now Boaz is bringing this theme in before David had ever written the Psalms. Um, Boaz is using this imagery and he's saying you've come to shelter under God's wings, uh, the God of Israel, and may this God bless you. And actually, I'm here in person to make sure that happens and uh, so um, then she said, I've I have found favour in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. Now I'm getting teary already. This is emotional stuff. She's saying you've been so kind to me, my Lord. He's he's a wealthy landowner. He's a somebody in the community. She's a nobody. She's a poor lady. And she says, I found favour in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. And at mealtime, Boaz said to her, listen to this, everyone. Boaz said to her, come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. He's inviting, he's inviting Ruth into what is a covenantal meal. Bread and wine. We do it. We will prob possibly do it today. Somewhere all around the world today, people will be breaking bread and drinking wine in remembrance of Jesus. But what are they doing there? They're observing a simple covenantal meal of bread and wine. And there's Boaz in, in that community with his friends and his, his laborers and people who work for him and his relatives and all the people from the village. And they're all there and they share this meal together, just like Jesus and the disciples at the Passover. And they dip their bread in the wine and eat it. It sounds a bit messy, but that was what they did. And he's saying, Ruth, you know, come on, dip your bread in our wine. He's saying, you're part of us. Oh, come on. I love it. Anyway, right, right. Here we go. Here we go. So, um, so. She dips the bread in the wine, etc., etc., and then, she, then they, they, he's the Boaz says to the guys, "Look, just give her some extra when she's gleaning. You know, fill her up, give her, let her go home loaded." Anyway, so anyway, I think I've mixed up the order of the story a little bit, but anyway, chapter three. Um, uh, Naomi. 
said to Ruth, listen, this is actually more fortuitous than we could even have orchestrated because Boaz is a really, really good man. He's also legally has an obligation to us because we want to sell this land because we can't manage it and we can't look after it. And technically, <laughs> Ruth, you come with the land because you are the widow of the guy who's, you're the widow of my son. And the, the there is a redeemer who should take responsibility for the land and for you. And so this is what she says. She says, wash yourself, therefore, this is chapter three, and anoint yourself and put on your cloak and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he's finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down and he will tell you what to do. And she replied, all that you say to me, I will do. Now, She's making herself so vulnerable. She's not only a widow and a poor person, but she's now, she's in a very male environment. And what she's doing effectively is she's sneaking into the bedroom of the boss and lying at the bottom of his bed. Now, obviously, they were all sleeping out under the stars by the, by the, um, by the cornfield. And because uh, it was so warm, they didn't need to be inside. And she and Naomi is smart. She's saying, "Get you, make yourself smell nice, love. Just you know, wash your armpits. Look, make make yourself look nice. Put something decent on. Put a bit of perfume on, and just go down there and sneakily when he's finished eating, he goes to lie down. Just go and lie at his feet. And this is what happened. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. Verse six, verse seven. When Boaz had eaten and drunk, and his heart was merry. He went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. So you can imagine the guys find a different patch by the grain and they're just going to curl up and have a sleep for the, for the night and then get back to work in the morning. But this beautiful, washed clean, gorgeous young woman smelling of perfume, all lovely, suddenly wafts in to the arena and covers um, and lies down at his feet. And in the, at midnight, the man was startled and turned over and behold, a woman lay at his feet. And he said, who are you? And she said, she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. And he said, may you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first in that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear I will do for you all that you ask um, that you um, for all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. And now it is true that I am a redeemer. Yet there is a one redeemer who is nearer than I. So what he's saying is, wow, this is incredible. You've come to me. You are a young woman. You could have gone after any of the young guys rich or poor basically he's saying you're a hottie my love you could have gone for anybody they would have married you whether rich or poor you know you could have had your pick of the guys is what he's saying but you've come to me and he's i love the humility of the guy he's over he's obviously an older guy he's been around a bit and no one's come his way and and he's kind of thinking, this is the life for me, I guess. And, and then suddenly there's this gorgeous lady, all lovely and clean and fresh and perfumed and <sighs> lying at his feet. And it's just so romantic. There's this warm summer, late summer evening, night, whatever. And it's warm and the crickets are all going zzz, 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 zzz. And there's a smell of all that freshly winnowed grain and they're lying oh man and then she oh come on this is so romantic and she comes and lies at his feet and she's basically saying i want you to redeem me i want i want to be by the land have me oh just be be my 
be my husband and my redeemer. But the, the statement is what I want to get because this, I believe, is so prophetic, is so profound. And the whole picture, the foreigner, the person, the bride with a disreputable past, if you like. She came from a line that began with incest and she's now been invited into covenant with this guy who is just a prince isn't he he's a lovely lovely guy and he's invited her into covenant and she's said cover me with your wings cover wings is just can be translated wings or garment in in this context it's exactly the same word so he she said just cover me with your garment put your wings over me bring me into your household and redeem me so how it worked was that when um, a widow or a poor person in the family had property, they could go to another member of the family, the extended family, and say, will you buy my land and be um, be my redeemer? And what that would do would keep it in the family. And so she's and of course, it was also in the law that the um, brother of the person who died if they left a widow should marry the widow so that that she could have children for the brother that had died but of course the brother that had died who was married to Ruth didn't have any brothers because he died as well and so Boaz was the nearest one except for one and there's always a little twist in the story and so it seems like a fantastic idea that Naomi's come up with but there's actually somebody who's nearer in line to to be the one to be the redeemer so Boaz says listen I'm going to talk to him tomorrow so you go home at first light before anyone can tell you're here and um but I'll take care of this so she goes home and um, Boaz makes sure she goes home with loads of grain as well and when she gets home, she tells Naomi what's happened. Naomi says, don't worry, he'll sort it out today because I know the kind of guy he is. He will not rest until this is taken care of. And so Boaz meets the guy at the city gate and they do a deal. And he says, look, there's this land. You can, you're the redeemer. You should redeem it. And the guy says, yes, I will. And then then Boaz throws in the little curveball and he says, there's one other thing that with the land, you have to marry Ruth, the widow of the guy. Um, and he's like, oh, darn, because that's going to complicate things with my own children and their inheritance. Nah, you if you're happy to marry her and do the redeeming, you do that. And so they take their sandals off and do all this slappy, whatever they do with their sandals. And basically the deal is done. Right. <laughs> so all of this happened in the town of Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Ah, oh, little town of Bethlehem. That's where Jesus is born. And this is introducing the town of Bethlehem into our thinking and into the storyline of the Bible. But also... Boaz and Ruth get married and it's a happy day and it's so romantic and everyone's got tears in their eyes and Naomi is so delighted and the widow who came in, the little humble widow woman from outside, from a foreign land, an outsider, a refugee, she comes in and she's sort of like attending the food bank. And now suddenly she is married to the guy who owns the whole farm. So, so she came with nothing. Now she owns a whole farm. It's awesome, isn't it? And uh, but listen to this at the end of the book here. It says these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Adminadab, Adminadab fathered Nashon, Nashon fathered Salmon, Salmon fathered Boaz, Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. Ba -da -ba -da. So Ruth and Boaz were the great grandparents of David. David is very, very important, and we will see why. 
later on in this series. But just for now, I want to take you back to this most profound truth. That in Jesus, redemption happens for the total outsider, for the person who is born into the most unpromising family, who has the most lousy background of all, who is full of grief, full of sorrow. Jesus comes and he pays the price for every single man and woman and child on the face of the earth irrespective of their backgrounds and this is what he's doing which is sort of jumps over his incarnation and birth and everything else and the death and resurrection what he's doing is he is buying for himself a bride but in the process he's redeeming the earth He's redeeming everything. He's redeeming the land. He's buying it back from the person who's owned it, who is the devil, who we saw from the first saunter of this series, who who in who got it by de deceit, if you like, by deceiving Adam and Eve. And Jesus comes, the redeemer, and he redeems the whole earth because he's after the bride. He, what he's he's what he really wants is the bride and so there we are Whew. that was a gallop so anyway listen i hope that's helpful have an amazing day think about ruth and just think about this wonderful wonderful redeemer and the whole purpose of the stable and the the nativity all of that stuff that we celebrate at christmas is because god is sending his son into the world the prince to marry the bride and redeem the world. Have an amazing day. Lots of love. Take care.